Good morning, everyone, to all of you online um, and all of you who have connected to follow these, this first hearing of the 187th period of sessions of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. And um, I, this, I am opening the first hearing of these sessions and it is entitled Violence and Discrimination Against Women, Girls, and Adolescents in Belize. And it was requested by the United Belize Advocacy Movement and Unibam Tikun Olam and PETAL, that is Promoting Environment Through Awareness for Lesbian and Bisexual Women. And these groups, I believe, are now here present. My name is Margaret May McCauley. I'm president of the <laughs> Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, and I am the rapporteur for Afro-descendant persons and for uh, the elderly, the rights of the elderly. With me and the panel, the uh, commission's panel this morning, are the first vice president, Commissioner, um, um, Commissioner and Rapporteur for the Rights of Children and Adolescents is Esmeralda Arisamina de Troitino and our brother, mm -hmm. Commissioner, the Rapporteur, Country Rapporteur for Belize, Joel Hernandez, and our sister Rapporteur for the Rights of Women, Commissioner Julissa Mantilla. And we also have representatives, the Assistant uh, um, Executive Secretary, Maria Claudia, and, and um, Paul Spencer, and Jean-Marc Morris. And uh, there are other staff members from the Secretariat here present. Good morning to all of you. And on behalf of, of the Commission and myself, I give you our warm and greetings to the state and to civil society and to those online. Let me, if I go any further, let me count, uh, um, explain the distribution of time so you can adjust your uh, uh, submissions to fit within the time. For civil society, you will have 20 minutes. And when you start, could you introduce yourselves for the recording? And for the state, also 20 minutes and for the commission's panel 20 minutes then we'll go back to civil society for their reply which will be 12 minutes hopefully and also the comments from the state in reply would be 12 minutes and the closing of the session by the commission will be six minutes let me just, uh, for those who are online, say, state the objective of the hearing. It is to present information on the situation of violence and discrimination against women, girls, and adolescents in Belize, taking into account multiple and intersectional discrimination factors, such as economic status, sexual orientation, and gender identity. Also, they, they will mention and deal with the regulatory and public policy gaps for the prevention of gender-based violence, discrimination and violence, which they will highlight for our benefit. Um, with that, I now invite uh, civil society to commence their um, submissions. Thank you. And please remember to introduce yourselves for the recording. Good morning, uh, commissioners and state representative. I am Kayla Porosco, executive director of the United Belize Advocacy Movement, the oldest and only LGBT-led policy and advocacy NGO in Belize. My colleague will join me later, Sharice Talbert, and she is the president of the of PETO which is promoting empowerment through awareness for lesbian and bisexual women. Are your speakers for today's thematic hearing. We acknowledge that the state successfully addressed COVID-induced economic conditions 
that could have destabilized the social fabric of the country. We acknowledge that the state had endured, have endorsed LGBT representation on the People's Constitutional Commission. We acknowledge that the state have created a national gender-based plan of action and a new gender policy, complemented with legislation like the Domestic Violence Act, Families and Children's Act, and the mechanism, the Family Court, which offers redress options to women. We acknowledge that the state threw its weight behind the European uh, Union project for gender-based violence called Spotlight to better support the needs of women and girls, particularly in family violence. We acknowledge that the state under the Ministry of Human, Deve Human Development, Family and Indigenous Peoples Affairs has invited a lesbian by women organization to represent vulnerable and marginalized women on the Commission for Families and Children, a commission that monitors the issues of family vulnerability. And that the state acknowledged gender equity and equality as its core values within the Ministry of Human Development. Uh, but we remain concerned that after 40 years of independence, the expected civil rights protection for LGBT Belizean remain elusive. For while the political tone has shifted the proverbial needle, the commitment to act remains transient. Despite our constitution defining laws created being void if inconsistent with the constitution like section 2.1, which speaks to being void if they are inconsistent with the constitution and sections speaking to discriminatory like section 16.1, which speaks to no law having any provision to be discriminatory. The state has chosen to ensure that its substantive legislation remains on the line with its constitutional obligations. The Domestic Violence Act, Families and Children's Act, Administration of a State Act, our legislation among many that remain inconsistent with our Equal Protection Clause, all needs amendment, not continued legislative exclusion. While Section 61 speaks to equal protection under the law and equal treatment under the law, this it continues to create new legislation that violates our constitution's equal protection clause. In addition, the preamble of our constitution speaks to the state is required to address economic and social disparity between citizens. It did not say that it had an option. These disparities show up too regularly in Petal's human rights desk documentation. Almost 300 cases between the period of 2021 to June 2023 speaks to less by women being discriminated upon. Victimized, re-victimized, remain accounted for through the Belize Crime Observatory, which collects, processes, analyzes, and stores crime data with a view of providing timely, reliable, and relevant information to its users, managed by the state. So I must ask in its official capacity to promote practices of, no. So I must ask, is it the official policy to promote practices of complicity by omission, indifference and inaction that undermines the right to dignity and our equal protection clause? Is it state policy to treat lesbian and bisexual Belizean women as collateral damage rather than make actual investment that tracks the experience of violence? When are the physical abused bodies of these women going to be acknowledged in state official data. We remain unprotected under the law. Women are supported, yes, but not in all their diversity. One such sketch that Petal documented occurred at the height of COVID when a client reported to the police that she was being abused by an intimate partner. The police would not take her report even though she had been threatened and it was a domestic dispute. Another case which currently only one of 15 since the air began, the lesbian couple being evicted by a landlord who expressed his homophobia upon learning that he was not a heterosexual couple renting from him. To add, the landlord sought to assist the assistance of the police to take the couple and their children out of the house, even though legislation states that only the court can evict. As the organization sitting on a national body that is for families and children, Petel notes, we see no justice for women and their children. 
The NCFC does not even have regular meetings held to address issues affecting marginalized and vulnerable women. The Families and Children Act does not acknowledge the that families exist in all their diversity, especially lesbian and bisexual women and their families. Opening lesbian and bisexual women and trans persons to threat of losing custody, parental rights, and family insecurity that is initiated by the partner. One such case occurred in 2023 when a trans person was forced to go to court to protect their custody demands for maintenance of child and parental rights. Unibama was instrumental in ensuring that legal counsel was provided in the defense of the father's threat to weaponize gender identity of the client in family court proceeding. It is noteworthy that trans citizens remain without the option of defining their gender markers in state identification documents in law. So I use the pronoun he and him out of respect. According to the International Gay and Lesbian Association, in 2019, nine treaty bodies made 137 SOGS references and 66 concluding recommendations on 56 different states. This included 10 follow-up recommendations to eight countries made by five committees. The 2018 review of the Universal Periodic Review showed that the state accepted 17 of 19 LGBT-related recommendations. The state has yet to give life to one of its recommendations. It's supported in Geneva now close to four years later. To highlight one example, the state accepted Human Rights Committee country recommendation for the third UPR review to introduce equality and hate crime legislation to provide protection for discrimination and violence for LGBT Belizeans. In furtherance of that commitment, the then United Democratic Party government and the National AIDS Commission developed and consulted on an equal opportunity bill in 2020 and a crime and a criminal code amendment bill on hate crime. The EOB contained protection for discrimination based on 22 protected characteristics, including sexual orientation and gender identity in access to services, education, employment, health, transportation, housing, and other essential spheres of influence and provided for the establishment of an equal opportunity commission and tribunal to promote equality and ensure affordable access to justice for victims of discrimination. The EOB also contained provisions to ensure confidentiality of people's HIV status and prevent employers from requiring mandatory HIV tests of potential employees. Following vocal and organized opposition to the EOB from church groups, the UDP dismissed their plan to table the EOB and the CCAB in parliament ahead of the 2020 general elections. Plans by the UDP government to introduce hate crime legislation by the way of, of a criminal code were also show. The 2020 general elections resulted in a change of government and the new People's United Party government has failed to adapt and progress on the EOB or the CCAB or to commit introducing their own equality or hate crime legislation. In January 2023, the Minister of Human Development, Families and Indigenous Peoples Affairs stated publicly that the government was considering hate crime legislation, but there has been no indication of progress to date. I now turn the presentation to my colleague, Sherry Stalbert. Good morning, everybody. Sherry Stalbert for promoting employment through awareness for lesbian and bisexual women. Interestingly, the state has been able to get over 11,000 non-citizens to sign up for a pathway to citizenship in the late 2022 and 2023. No easy feat of the state's apparatus. However, its ability to pass a single piece of legislation that addresses discrimination remains stalled. In addition, the state has made many positive interventions about women's rights, but its ability to pass a criminal code amendment to address hate crime legislation that would increase sentencing for persons who commit acts of violence based on characteristics such as sexual orientation, gender identity, disability, gender, membership of a religious group, and sex remains stalled. Despite the state's public declaring many statements of commitment to women and girls, it has never committed to them in all their diversity in any le national legislation. One such case is a bisexual woman who was constantly being harassed 
threatened and even assaulted by her neighbor because of her sexual orientation to the point of wanting to end her life before her neighbor had the opportunity to act on his threats to her. No police intervention occurred, even after going public to seek aid in addressing this issue. Instead, the police, when she visited the station one last time to make a report on the incident, was advised by the officer on duty that since she tried to fight off her attacker, that they were even as she hit him and he hit her. In a separate case, another lesbian walking on the street minding her own business in broad daylight was attacked and threatened that she would be raped to ensure she made up her mind whether she'd be a man or a woman in a relationship. She sought the assistance of the police to make a report and was not assisted, but rather laughed upon and told that they did not rape her. So why was she there um, needing to make a report of the incident? Furthermore, when legislation extends basic protection from violence based on sexual orientation and gender identity, symbols of the state has no obligation to investigate. Why? Lesbian and bisexual women and trans persons have no access to the same protection orders that is issued generously under the Domestic Violence Act. As an organization with a priority on ending violence against women and girls, conducting monthly education and information sharing regarding support that exists for, system, for victims of gender-based violence, speaking to over 100 women at any given outreach is priority. We remain concerned as the Domestic Violence Act provides no support for LB women. They cannot file a report at the Domestic Violence Unit, which is opposite to treatment that hetero couples receive at the DVU. One such issue of equal unequal treatment is access to shelters. Only victims in hetero relationships can file a report of domestic dispute at the DVU and access the support package for victims and survivors of GDV. Petal houses LB women who are victims of violence for up to a week until we can find something more long-term for them. Their cases are not even documented as DV incidents. As of 2021, we have housed and fed 27 LB women that could not access the support of the police or the shelter to address their issues of GBV. Challenges continue to exist with the department and various ministries responsible for providing the support to women and adolescent girls in accessing sexual and reproductive health and rights education and services who are being affected by the different forms of uh, primarily gender-based violence. Even holding a seat on the National Gender and Gender-Based Violence Committee does not result in lessening the experience of discrimination as the dignity and rights of LB and trans persons remain expendable in the full enjoyment of their rights as citizens. The committee has also been dormant since the onset of COVID, which subjected many women, especially LB women, to more incidences of GBV. We have within March 2020 to December of 2022, a total of 768 cases of GBV incidents against LB women. Women are not being able to access psychosocial support from emotional, physical, and psychological violence. Of these cases, 173 are women that were not able to report their cases of violence through the domestic violence unit. What happens is that they end up not receiving any support from the state, informing them where they can make their reports known. Another 68 are cases of women being bullied and threatened to have conversion therapy inflicted upon them for not wanting to be normal. And 27 are house evictions based on their sexual orientation. Again, the absence of legislation to protect against the discrimination of hate or hate crimes have initiated a culture of complicity by the state that grants ordinary citizens the right to be violent against LB women. We add undocumented migrant women remain vulnerable to abuse by symbols of the state who experience intimate partner violence that clashes with their immigrant status. Women with disability or mental health issues remain invisible under the state expenditure as the state spends barely 1% of its budget on mental health at last count. While the former government endorsed the Equal Opportunities Bill, 
which protects women from discrimination based on pregnancy, family responsibilities, disability, sexual orientation, gender identity, domestic violence, and marital status. This represents a third of the characteristics of protection that total 22 in all. While the new government endorses values of gender equity and equality in its plan Belize framework, the state has not expressed any serious commitment to ensure its action is not inconsistent with the state's own values of committing to equality and gender equity for its citizens. Lastly, we cannot forget that trans persons remain invisible as citizens. The population remains vulnerable to violence and discrimination practices in the delivery of state services, especially accessing immigration services and employment services. One trans case do uh, documented by Unibam revealed that this trans Belizean sought to get her passport renewed. And not only did the immigration officer reveal her gender identity among co-workers, but mocked her presence as well. Her appointment to renew her passport, she felt, was intentionally delayed. Furthermore, there is no mechanism to address conflict on public transportation. Trans persons reveal that other passengers either refuse to sit next to them or refuse to allow them a seat. The right to movement is a fundamental right under the constitution, but its exercise remains the burden of the individual. The Equal Opportunities Bill would solve such a problem with access to redress through a commission. Its approval by parliament remains out of sight in 2023. We call on the state to do the following. One, to establish a date for the submission of the Equal Opportunities Bill to address gender-based violence deficiencies in the law, addressing discrimination and criminal code amendment that can increase sentencing for perpetrators that commit acts of violence that impact LGBT plus Belizeans. Two, to revise legislation that offer trans citizens the option to determine their gender marker on national identification documents. Three, to create and adopt a legal review of a civil rights agenda, which addresses the needs of LGBT plus persons, including with disability and affected by mental health issues. And lastly, four, to determine a national strategic framework for dealing with mental health issues in the justice system. Thank you. Thank you very much um, to representatives of civil society. Thanks for your wholesome submissions and for keeping within your time. Um, that's very good management of time. Um, your Excellency uh, um, Ambassador Young of Belize, uh, it now falls to the state to make their submissions. I, I We are aware that normally you would not carry the burden, but I don't, I'm not sure that anybody has connected from capital. So um, could you let us know what you will do? Sure, and we uh, thank you, we thank you really for your commitment to the, the system, the inter-American system of human rights for being present, um, despite the fact that you're not supposed to carry the burden of the substantive reply on behalf of the state. We thank you deeply for being here. Thank you, Madam President. And uh, thanks both for both presenters for their presentation. Um, so unfortunately, I received the, the final update um, on Saturday. I sent it to our capital. Um, it's early in the morning there. I don't think anyone is in the offices yet. Uh, because you know they're two hours behind, so that might be part of the reason why nobody is on as yet. But um, what I, if if it is possible, can can we ask that the government of Belize can perhaps um, make a submission at a later date? Is that allowable? That we can perhaps do after we've reviewed all the information that we now have, um, we'll be in a better position to to make a substantive response. And um, of course, 
Uh, all of the presenters have put forward will be taken into consideration. Uh, I must say that, that the government of Belize takes these matters very seriously, but um, until we received all the until we received all the information, it, it wasn't realistic for us to prepare a submission on this one. Thank you so much, Ms. Uh, thank you so much, Your Excellency. And, and it is quite understandable in the circumstances. Uh, um, at, uh, I'm sure some of the members in Capitol are just waking up and trying to get themselves ready to leave their homes to go to the office. Um, so it, it is understandable um, because especially if there's a misunderstanding about the time, um, um, which was stated. Um, I myself had a bit of um, confusion this morning um, because we are one hour behind DC and it's a good thing I checked and found out um, it was in fact DC time and not Jamaican time. So um, yeah. I, I think definitely the states can have time. I'm sure my colleagues on the panel would agree Perhaps the, your your submissions can be submitted in writing um, to us, which we will then also send to civil society here present, and we we will discuss the time as we go along. Are you able to stay until the end, Mr. Ambassador? Yes, I will. Thank you so very much. And again, I apologize. Like I said, you know, I received the, the latest uh, statement um, on Saturday, mm -hmm. which I forwarded, but. You know, actually, there's nobody in the office. I don't know if anybody checked their emails. Quite. Um, but certainly, we'll, we'll prepare a written statement and we'll submit that. Thank, well, thank you for that. Thank you so much. Sure. I, I now invite um, the representatives uh, here present on the panel for the commission. And the, I call on the country rapporteur, Commissioner Joel Hernandez. We have 20 minutes. Yes, muchas gracias. Eh, muchas gracias, eh, Presidenta, y saludo con mucho afecto a las eh, personas representantes de las organizaciones de la sociedad civil que han solicitado esta audiencia, así como también al embajador Lin Yong, eh, embajador de representante permanente de Belice ante, ante la OEA. Me parece que es muy importante esta, esta audiencia por varias razones. Quiero empezar por felicitar a las organizaciones solicitantes por haber eh, solicitado esta audiencia, haber acudido ante la comisión para poner sobre la mesa un tema de gran importancia para el gozo y disfrute de los derechos humanos en Belice. Lo sabemos, no estoy diciendo nada nuevo, son pocas las oportunidades que tenemos para conocer sobre la situación de los derechos humanos en Belice. Y lo que me ha gustado mucho de la presentación de ustedes es que han venido destacando una serie de medidas que ha tomado ya el Estado en materia de igual eh, protección jurídica de la ley, eh, algunas que inclusive están ya registradas por la Secretaría Ejecutiva, como son precisamente lo que tiene que ver con eh, la, la, el programa de prevención y respuesta firme frente a la violencia sexual, eh, la iniciativa Spotlight, la política nacional de género, el plan de acción contra la violencia de género, y así como alguna otra institucionalidad, eh, marcadamente la Comisión Nacional de la, de la Mujer. Eh, la audiencia, eh, sin embargo, la presentación por la, hecha por la representación de sociedad civil, también nos hace ver de algunos desafíos que existen hoy en la implementación de esa ley. Y esto pareciera ser que está muy relacionada con el desarrollo de políticas públicas que aseguren una igualdad jurídica de todas las personas ante la ley, pero sobre todo políticas en contra de la discriminación por cualquier tipo. Aquí hemos escuchado de esta discriminación que se da eh, inclusive en los niveles operativos, en los niveles de aplicación de la ley en contra de mujeres, eh, en, en contra de mujeres en razón de su preferencia sexual o de su identidad de género y también falta de políticas públicas para atender adecuadamente denuncias en contra de violencia eh, eh, sexual. Eh, en resumen, 
veo yo que aquí hay una gran oportunidad para que la comisión pueda hacer una contribución. Existe un marco jurídico y existe una institucionalidad en Belice, pero al mismo tiempo existe la necesidad de ponerla en práctica. Y para eso, en mi carácter de relator para Belice, pongo a su disposición las eh, capacidades que tiene la Secretaría Ejecutiva de la Comisión para poder proveer asistencia técnica. Y esta puede ser de cosas muy, muy concretas, como por ejemplo... Eh, el desarrollo de capacidades en las autoridades encargadas de aplicar estas, estas leyes. Inclusive, eh, la práctica ya desarrollada por la Comisión permite que estas capacitaciones puedan realizarse inclusive de forma, de forma virtual. Así que eso es lo que creo que vale la pena de esta audiencia por conducto del embajador Lin Jung, poner a la disposición del gobierno de Belice estas formas de colaborar de la CIDH. Eh, aprovecho también para eh, poner a consideración del gobierno de Belice una visita que pueda realizar en mi carácter de relator para, para, para el país, eh, acompañado por mis colegas que quisieran unirse a una visita a Belice y poder revisar con sociedad civil esta, esta agenda, estos temas tan importantes que han traído a nuestra atención. Eh, gracias, gracias, presidenta Macaulay. Thank you, um, um, my brother, Howell, um, for your intervention. I, I now call on the rapporteur, the thematic rapporteur um, for this issue, um, Commissioner Ulisa Mantira, our sister. Eh, muchas gracias, señora presidenta. Un saludo muy cordial a mis colegas de la comisión y al equipo técnico siempre y a las traductoras que usted siempre nos recuerda a saludar. Eh, inicio también con un agradecimiento a la sociedad civil por haber eh, solicitado esta audiencia, que como dice el relator de país, nos permite reflexionar sobre, sobre muchos temas. Y yo me sumo a la, al ofrecimiento de cooperación, pero quisiera hacer una reflexión y una invocación dirigida específicamente al embajador John, a quien saludo con mucho respeto. Eh, y creo que tiene que ver con, más allá del fortalecimiento del marco nacional, la necesidad de ratificación de tratados internacionales. Eh, celebro muchísimo su participación aquí eh, como representante de Belice, pero creo que también es un momento importante para pensar en ratificación desde la Convención Americana de Derechos Humanos con otros tratados. El marco internacional es también un marco de protección, es también un marco que permite la participación activa, no solo en sociedad civil, sino también el apoyo en el Estado. La Comisión Interamericana, y lo digo con, todo, con toda la franqueza, tiene una estrategia eh, pensada en el Caribe, eh, que se va a seguir desarrollando y que incluye estas visitas que, que mencionaba el relator. Pero quizás también es el momento de reflexionar en cuál sería la posibilidad jurídica de ratificación de tratados. Esta es una comisión que el próximo año va a tener tres representantes caribeñas. Y creo que es un momento importante también para hablar del fortalecimiento del marco internacional. Ratification of treaties is very important to consolidate these international human rights protections. And I think that civil society... We, We always have the, the, the open door from the commission, but this is the moment to talk with the state as well. How to implement that? I'm talking about the American Declaration of Human Rights. You know, besides you ratify, ratify or not the treaty, you have this American Declaration of Human Rights. This is the framework. How do we can work together to implement this framework, not only in local and national policies, but also in the international ratification for treaties. And finally, to the social uh, society, I changed to English to speak directly with you. Thank you very much, not only for, as I always say, not only for your presence today, but for the daily work that you do every single day. It's so difficult to work with these issues when nobody understand, not necessarily understand everything, but not only the framework, but do your feeling, how to, to what does it mean to, to grow up in society do we don't understand that you have the right to be as you are. This or sexual orientation, gender identity, we're talking about human rights, and we're talking about dignity of people. So dignity means to recognize that you are equal, 
Thank you for your work and for all the people that you are representing now in front of the Inter-American Commission. You have our thankful and um, you know our support. Thank you very much. Gracias, señora presidenta. Thank you so much, my sister Julissa. And it is now my pleasure uh, to invite the first vice president, our sister Esmeralda, to make her interventions as the rapporteur for children and adolescent rights. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Presidenta. También el saludo a todos y todas. Al señor embajador Lin John, muchas gracias por su presencia en, este, en esta audiencia y a la sociedad civil por todo su trabajo, tal como lo, se lo plantea la comisionada Julissa. Yo tengo dos puntos que me gustaría in, eh, que a la hora de una respuesta por parte del Estado tener alguna información respecto a el tema de las niñas y de las adolescentes en el tema de violencia sexual, o sea, los datos, los registros, y la situación de las niñas y adolescentes en esta condición de, de género, de su identidad de género, que sabemos hay una situación, una circunstancia muy particular que enfrentan eh, el, el grupo de eh, niñas eh, que, que están en esta, en esta búsqueda de su identidad sexual. Me gustaría tener algo de información respecto de eso. Y eh, bueno, también pues a la sociedad civil si hay los datos correspondientes. Y el otro punto es, eh, la, la sociedad civil nos planteaba que hay un reconocimiento constitucional muy importante, pero que hay leyes que abiertamente, no sé si eso lo tengo claro, me gustaría tener esa visión de la sociedad civil, que hay leyes que violentan la norma constitucional y que esto no se refleja en una posición de <coughs> propuestas de reforma a la ley o si es necesario las propuestas de reforma constitucional. Me gustaría tenerlo un poco más claro porque me parecía eh, que, eh, que, que el tema normativo no deja de tener una relevancia a la hora de la exigencia del derecho, de la posibilidad de demandar el derecho. Entonces, es, esos dos aspectos y compartiendo eh, las posiciones de mis colegas Yulisa eh, Mantilla y el comisionado Joel Hernández en, en materia de eh, apoyo técnico, cooperación técnica y de esta visita a Belice. Muchas gracias, Presidenta. Thank you very much, um, my sister um, Esmeralda. Um, uh, Ma um, Maria Claudia, do you wish to intervene? Thank you, Madam President. Eh, solamente para un aspecto muy puntual y es en seguimiento lo manifestado por la Comisión, indicar eh, que estamos a toda disposición desde la Secretaría Ejecutiva para avanzar en esa posibilidad de cooperación técnica, tanto con el Estado como si así lo, lo requirieran las organizaciones de la sociedad civil. Entonces, tenemos todo un abanico de posibilidades de cooperación que ponemos a su disposición, tanto desde a partir de la sección de cooperación técnica y política pública, como concretamente si se trata de desarrollos de capacidades desde la sección de capacitación y promoción. Tenemos una estructura, tenemos estos, estas posibilidades y estamos a su disposición. Muchas gracias. And can I, before I speak, can I also, can I also ask um, advisor Paul Spencer, do you wish to intervene? Just to uh, reconfirm what um, my colleague Maria Claudia has said. And as you know, um, Commissioner and President Macaulay, we have had two very successful Visits three. to Karkin, three, three successful visits to Karkin countries in the last year, where we were able to provide, you know, technical cooperation support to both the state and non-state actors. So we look forward to doing the same. And I recall Commissioner Hernandez 
had mentioned the possibility of a visit uh, when he met uh, virtually with, with Ambassador Young at the beginning of this year. So it's good to know that that possibility is still on the table and we hope it can be uh, accommodated in the not too distant future. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. Um, 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 <laughs> Mr. Spencer, you've taken quite a number of my the subjects I wanted to touch on, but but that's all right. I I would just uh, um, um, highlight this in, before we moved from it seems to your last thing that in relation to the visits, I I um, your Excellency um, I wish we wish you to convey that to the government of Belize that we have um, following a strategic plan that uh, Caribbean region is now a priority region for the Caribbean. And I will assure you, Your Excellency, that we worked, I, I myself worked avidly to get this situation for the Caribbean within the commission's interest. And, and it is a priority region now. And for, because of that, we were able to do a, a visit to Dominica last year and then to Suriname and just up to last a few days uh, to St. Lucia. And in those visits, they were very, we covered very important issues and matters, um, both for the state actors, the officials of the state, ministers of government, their staff, um, we, we did promotional uh, training and technical uh, information and gave technical support when requested. And we also did the same for civil society groups within each of these countries. Uh, they were very important visits because these Caribbean countries had, had not had the benefit of this, especially with the development of, of um, conventional instruments within our, our system. And I keep reminding all, in all the countries where we go, that we have to be aware of the fact and proud of the fact that our Declaration on the Rights and Duties of Man was the first international human rights document in the world. Most people think it was the Universal Declaration, it was not. They, that followed about almost eight months after the Inter-American Declaration had been in place. So we should act accordingly. And we would like truly to echo um, my brother, Country Commissioner Joel Hernandez, to do a promotional and technical training visit to Belize. It is a country which clearly from looking at the records, I just checked the records, Belize as a state needs and its people's need. We ought to be there and to try and assist in any way we can. And secondly, I wish to ask civil society whether they have sought to uh, the commission to, uh, to use its mechanism on the Article 18 to write a letter requesting information from the government why the Equal Opportunities Bill has not been put back on the legislative agenda since 2021 up to date. That is a mechanism which would have been part of the training had we been able to visit Suriname, um, Belize, which we did in all the other countries was one part of it. So we can assist you with that, and we can um, um, ask the state through His Excellency. Perhaps the state can focus on that as well to explain to the Commission why that bill has not been put back on the legislative agenda up to the state. We look forward to working closer with you because there are all the international instruments of the inter-American system are waiting, signing and ratification, the signature and ratification of Belize. So please let us assist you, Mr. Ambassador, if you would give that message to Capital. I thank all of you again and 
most avidly our interpreters for assisting us this morning and all of you who are online. Um, so with that, I call this Excuse first me. hearing. Excuse me, Madam President, if we can take a picture for the participants before oh, yes, the, yes. the public hearing. Good, for reminding. Could you all, uh, I have to take off my mask. Tell me when you're ready. Marlene, go away. Uh, thank you so much for the, for the time. So if you can just okay. look at the camera for me one second. Thank you so much. Finish? Yes, done. Thank you, Tiago. So that is uh, one of the, he's one of our, our um, talented uh, photographers. So thank you, all of you. Thank you very, very much for your participation in this first hearing of the 187th period of sessions of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. Have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.